We're now going to start our panel that is going to be addressing uh, improvements in energy efficiency and the role that it can make in our economy. Uh, and we will also, as part of this, be looking at um, high-speed rail in, in conjunction with uh, energy efficiency improvements as well. Our first presenter is Jennifer Schaefer, who is Executive Director of the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition. Jennifer. Um, so I'm here today to represent the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition. It's a group of energy service companies that are approved on a federal contract to do work with the federal government to do energy savings contracts. They're called energy savings performance contracts. Um, our members, I should mention that first briefly, are Amaretto, Chevron, Constellation, Honeywell, Johnson Control, Lockheed Martin, Nextera, and Resco, Shadow, Siemens, and Chinese. Um, they do about 90% of the performance contracting with the federal government, um, and they're all approved on an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract that the federal government has that sort of pre-qualifies companies to do large-scale, comprehensive energy efficiency retrofits with the feds. Um, who here knows what an ESPC is? It's a It's a lot better than if I'd asked five years ago. Um, so ESPCs are contracts where the contractor, the company, goes into a facility, they audit the facility for the available energy savings, they work with the federal customer to figure out what they want, what are their problems with the facility, um, are they interested in getting solar panels, you know, everybody's got an idea of what they need. What I really need is for my lighting to be good enough that I can see, or, you know, what we really want is a new laundry facility, there's all sorts of things they want. Um, so then they work together and package together a group of energy conservation measures that will, um, that will save energy, save money, and serve the needs of the federal government. So they not only do the auditing, find the measures, they also provide the financing, they enter into a long-term contract with the federal government, and um, they measure and verify that energy savings are occurring, and they guarantee that those savings are occurring. Um, that's really very different than what, happen, well, than what happens other places. So it is by statute, by our statute law, um, guarantee is there. Interestingly, Oak Ridge National Laboratory did a study recently on federal ESPCs and found that um, they're delivering on average almost twice as much energy savings as the amount guaranteed. So imagine... Um, before an energy savings performance contracting, you're spending $100 a month on your energy savings bill, on your energy bills to utilities, water, electric, gas, anybody else. And then after, during the term of the ESPC, you're only spending 60 bucks, but you're paying back the energy service company about $37, $38, so your savings are a couple bucks a month. But after the term of the contract ends, you're saving all $40, and you're just paying that 60 to the energy company. So it's the guarantee that's really different for them. Um, and they're pretty popular right now. Um, they're done not only in the federal space, but also in what we call the mush market. Not a pretty name, but it stands for municipal, municipal utility um, schools and hospitals. So public institutions is kind of where it works, because to get attractive financing rates, um, being in a government-related public building is, is attractive. Harder to do this in commercial buildings, although, although it certainly is being done. Um, on a sort of one-off basis. Um, currently, we're, um, our group, which um, I think our major role in life is to play whack-a-mole. So what we do is we just try to get all the problems that pop up around ESPCs in the federal space to, to back down. Um, so mostly right now what we're working on is the president announced in December of 2011 a um, $2 billion initiative, which is the company's money to invest in the federal government to do energy savings performance contracting and get paid back over time. So we're really working hard to make sure that's going well, to do the whack-a-mole with various agencies and institutions. Um, and right now there's upwards of half a million, or half a billion to probably 600 million thereabouts already under contract. Um, there's a lot more where we've had selections. So why am I beeping? Um, sorry. 
So we think that we're going to be fairly successful with the President's initiative and reach somewhere around the $1.4 to $1.6 billion level, which is a huge improvement over the annual amounts we've done to date. Um, the other thing is here in Congress, there's a caucus in the House of Representatives called the Energy Savings Performance Caucus, chaired by Representatives Gardner and Welch. Um, it's got about 30 some odd members, very bipartisan. Um, they'll be introducing legislation to sort of encourage more use of ESPCs and ongoing activities. So um, that's about it. I will let the others speak. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, because I think that it is exciting to see how much progress that there is and that this is becoming an ever bigger slice of the market. We're now going to turn to Mike Kendall, who is the Senior Communications Associate with, uh, the, with BPI, Building Performance Institute. And you're welcome to use the podium or at the table. I'll sit if you don't mind. Um, so first off, thanks to the Sustainable Energy Coalition for inviting us to be here um, and at the Expo as well. We've been here for the past few years and hope to be here for quite some time uh, into the future. Um, so generally, to start out, the Building Performance Institute uh, set standards and as a standard setting and credentialing organization uh, for the home performance industry. And how many people are familiar with home performance? With regard to residential buildings. Right, we got one, two, three, four, five, there's a few of us. Fantastic. Um, so generally a lot of you don't know, so this is a good opportunity for me. Um, it's a young industry, it's still growing, but it is gaining steam as uh, we get out into the market a little bit more and gain some recognition. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the industry, uh, the simplest way to explain it is whole houses as a system contracting. And the approach focuses on how your whole house works. Uh, rather than isolating projects um, like replacing your air conditioning, your heating, we take a step back and look at everything and how it interacts. And the best comparison we can make uh, is to the old school cars that you guys used to drive, or just kind of a young crowd, uh, used to ride it 20 or so years ago. You know, the old station wagons that just guzzled gas and were really loud and really dirty, and, uh, took up the whole roadway and whatnot. Um, and if you're still driving them today, it would cost you an arm or leg uh, to rebuild. Uh, so we take that kind of idea and we compare it with the eco-friendly cars of today, somewhat like the Prius. Uh, and we look at the fact that engineers didn't just fix two or three things on those old cars to make them more energy efficient uh, and more cleaner uh, cars to drive. They looked at the whole system, top to bottom, front to back, and created a more efficient way for clean cars to operate. And that's the same thing that home performance contractors do only with homes. Uh, many times when you think about having work done in your house, uh, it's because you're uncomfortable. And a lot of times you go to the thermostat and you'll make it hotter or colder, but you still won't get that sweet spot uh, temperature. Uh, or worse, or and your energy bills will be untouched. Generally they'll go up. The more heat you use, the more cold you use, the higher your bills will be. Or worse, you start going around your house after you play with that thermostat and you see condensation on your windows, you see mold growth and things like that, uh, and it leads to fairly unhealthy conditions as far as your home is concerned. You start coughing more. You, even for asthmatics, there's been studies that uh, homes that are not uh, up to par as far as, far as weather sailing and whatnot, uh, they are prone to even more serious health risks. Um, so you start thinking about how to move along and, and touch on some of these issues, and your initial thought is to tackle each one individually, uh, which will cost you a lot of time and money if you do so. Not to mention that there's no guarantee that your problems are going to be solved if you approach each individual comfort issue individually. The home performance contractor takes a step back and he approaches the, the, the home from a, an all-inclusive kind of perspective. Uh, he looks at how the whole house works, analyzes the different components of your, house, of your house and how they interact with one another, and they look at your home mechanical systems, shell inner workings, including insulation, HVAC, weather sealing, and determine how they all work best together. Uh, today, people buying energy efficiency upgrades uh, quickly go for new efficient HVAC systems. They go for solar installations. And these things will help you achieve your goal of energy efficiency, but they're not going to get you the whole way there. By focusing on your whole house's system, sealing it up first, it ensures that you get the best bang for your buck. If you go and install a solar system right away without paying attention to the other little things that could help your house along, you're just going to throw your money away. You're still going to lose energy. You're not going to be as comfortable as you could be if you took the time to seal it up first and 
then move on to the renewable stages. Um, yeah. So you can improve your health and safety, you can reduce your energy costs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so a lot of people at this point ask what BPI is. BP. BPI has to do with all of this. Uh, BPI develops the standards that make sure the work on your, done on your home is done correctly. And we bring building science experts from across the country in to collaboratively work on this, uh, on our standards, um, using a consensus-based methodology. And from these standards, we develop certifications for individuals and accredited companies um, that become the elite firms in the industry uh, by virtue of the fact that they have to commit to third-party quality, uh, quality assurance uh, checks once the work is done. So they'll come in, they'll do an audit, pre, or pre-audit, they'll do the work, they'll do a test out post-audit, and then they'll bring in another company to make sure that the work they did was done correctly. Uh, in short, we provide risk management um, to energy efficiency programs, and we are currently recognized federal, state, and utility uh, in over 150 programs across the country. Additionally, for over 15 years, uh, our standards and credentials supported the weatherization assistance program. Uh, we've seen over 7 million low-income homes weather, weatherized, over 14,000 jobs created, and this is something that's near and dear to us now because the president is now uh, re-requesting an increase in budget for the weatherization program, about $240 million. Uh, this is a budget that's been cut over the past few years to pretty much bare minimum because it's fairly easy to cut it out. It's a small amount of energy. It's, it has to do with energy efficiency. For low income housing, they think that there's other money, uh, or there's other things that are more important for this money. But this money will go to help low income families improve their quality of life, uh, improve <coughs> their houses, which is important enough. It will reduce energy uh, over the long run. And I don't know the exact percentage, but it's something around 40% of the nation's energy is used by individual homes. So if we can start focusing on energy efficiency retrofits in, in, in individual low-income housing, we could drastically reduce that number. Uh, so we are in full support of the 2014 request of that total amount. Uh, finally, there are 100 million homes needing weatherization energy efficiency upgrades across the country. Uh, and if we start focusing on these energy efficiency retrofits, we get together and find solutions that will bring en energy retrofits to low-income houses to the homeowners at large, and we can really make an impact uh, on energy efficiency, cost savings, health and safety, and increased jobs all around us. Great, thank you very much. We will now turn to Eric Huffman, who is the Director of Sales for Synoptic Acuity Brands, because you know what? Daylighting makes a huge difference. I think I will stand up. Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon. Let me start with a special thank you to Carol and EESI and, and also Ken Bosong, who's helped put the event together for every year that we've been involved. It's a real privilege to be here, so thanks to both the groups. Um, I'd also like to welcome our honored, honored guests, uh, congressional staffers, and those that are here today. It's, it's a real privilege to be able to speak here. I'd like to thank my fellow uh, panelists, Jennifer, Mike, Jeff, Andy, and Dave as well. As Carol said, my name is Eric Huffman. I'm Director of Sales for Sun Optics. We're a division of Acuity Brands. For those that haven't heard of Acuity, we're a publicly traded company based in Conyers, Georgia, and uh, our large lighting manufacturer and uh, controls company as well. So uh, we have uh, about 6,000 associates around the globe and about $2 billion in sales. The brief time I have today, we'll uh, review just two key points. One is uh, the d discuss the benefits of daylighting, which is part of the company that I'm involved in as Sun Optics, and then uh, specifically top lighting as a design strategy, and how the energy consumption can be affected when we utilize that strategy, strategy effectively. And then secondly, I'll also briefly mention a few of the uh, legislative initiatives that are ongoing right now, and how the impact of both direct solar amendment for the DOD um, and the energy bill, which is S.761, uh, would be very beneficial to both energy efficiency and the economy. So the simple definition of daylighting is just the use of natural light in space to eliminate the need for electric light throughout the day. When we can use that as a strategy, what we call top lighting, which is when we bring that daylight in through the roof, through a skylight. And when properly designed, a skylight and the electric lighting control system, when integrated together, can optimize the energy savings in a building. Now, the U.S. has made great strides in energy efficiency, as demonstrated by many of the people in this room and what you can see in the expo as well. And uh, we've, we've made some progress in that. However, we've only scratched the surface. 
uh, the latest study by the uh, Commercial Buildings Energy Consumption Survey, which was done in 2003, they're doing a new one this year for 2000 uh, for the most recent version. Just gave us a few facts that you may have heard before, but um, out of the total commercial buildings, we have 71.6 billion square feet of floor space, and we consume more than 6,500 trillion BTUs of energy. 21% of that energy is used for lighting. So when we can use daylighting to minimize the need for electric lighting throughout the day, we can have a tremendous impact on that energy consumption. So there's much that can be done to reduce that consumption and maximize our savings. The potential impact uh, in, in documented numerous studies, including the, a DOE study that was done in 2008 called the Top Lighting Report. And day, the daylighting or top lighting uh, is one of the most useful ways to reduce that energy consumption. And what that report helped point out was, regardless of geographic area in the country, and regardless of building zone type, uh, by incorporating a, a proper design of a skylight and that design strategy, we can reduce that consumption of energy in the space. So how many people have a skylight in their house? Anybody? Right. So you're probably used to having that spotlight track across the floor throughout the day. Maybe it fades the carpets and the drapes. The dog likes to lie there usually. But uh, you know, most people associate that with skylights. And, and that's fine. And then a lot of people also associate, hey, my skylights do what? They leak. A lot of people say, associate leaks with skylights. So those are two of the most common myths that we deal with regularly, especially in commercial building space. And we want to get past those very quickly. And through proper design, we can do that. So uh, we, can, we can overcome those small hurdles that we have. Many people also associate the excessive heat and UV uh, damage uh, through skylights. And when we can, again, use a proper design of a skylight, uh, we can eliminate that concern as well. And we can demonstrate this through many clients that we have. One, is, one example is Walmart, where we've done over almost 5,000 other properties. Typical project uh, saves about $100,000 per year. Return on investment is about 18 months. So they see significant savings as well, and so we can prove our benefits in the space. Of course, since the beginning of time, we've used natural light to light a space, and only recently have we gotten away from that by using artificial lighting. So we want to make sure that as we incorporate these strategies of including electric lighting, natural lighting, and controls to truly light a space most efficiently. Even Thomas Edison himself said, and I quote, we are like tenant farmers chopping down the fence around our house for fuel when we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. I put my money on the sun, solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. End of quote. So there's two current legislative efforts that I mentioned previously. First is the amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. This amendment makes an underlying uh, statutory change to the DOD's uh, required energy uh, uh, regarding direct solar. And this would allow them to incorporate direct solar or passive solar lighting, which is daylighting, into their projects. The second piece of legislation that we're asking for support on is that we would have a, uh, and have a positive impact on the economy and job creation is the Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act, which is S761. This bill includes incentives for energy efficiency and for whole building performance. It's not just based on, it's based on systems rather than products and looks at the building as a complete system. This bill would uh, boost the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturers and create jobs in the manufacturing, sourcing, distribution, and service sectors. Potential economic impact is significant from both of these bills. And we are asking for the support of Congress. And if you would ask your congressmen as well and senators to support these, it could have a dramatic impact on uh, the economy at, at large. One final quote I have for today is, uh, you know, this concept of daylighting and eliminating the need for natural uh, electric light throughout the day as much as possible is, is something that was echoed even this morning uh, for some of the congressmen that spoke at the expo. Uh, the Sec Energy Secretary Chu said it as well. He said, and I quote, the cleanest energy is not solar, geothermal, or wind. It's energy saved, the energy that is never used at all. And that's the entire concept around daylighting when we can incorporate it into the space. If you have any questions, we're in the expo set up at B14. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you.
And we'll now turn to Jeff Beider, who is the managing partner with Capstone Turbine Distributor, uh, part of Infinity Distributed Generation. Jeff? Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I guess I'll have to ask a question like others did. Does everyone know what combined heat and power is? CHP? Combined heat and power? Okay, well, it's, on, it's, it's an energy savings mechanism. It's extremely energy efficient. And uh, we use various types of fuel to, uh, to generate electricity and thermal energy. So, you know, our turbines, which I'll tell you about in a minute, you know, use a natural gas or a biogas or even diesel gas and make electricity. And then the heat that comes off our jet engine is used to make hot water, chilled water, or steam simultaneously. And it could do it with or without the electric utility grid. So we hear about resiliency and the importance, importance to have the ability to go to a standalone or island operation, and that's what capstone turbine manufacturer uh, turbines do. So a little bit about capstone, if I may. I'm a distributor. We, uh, we have offices in Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Clarksburg, West Virginia, and Orlando, Florida. Um, our number one job is started out as a mercenary mission to educate the community on CHP. And what uh, what effects it has because we've seen the super escos and others always take a run at the sort of I guess uh, attractive energy return on investment projects and and as those start to get chewed up um, and get taken advantage of and we see success um, we're starting to see some of the super escos turn to small scale CHP so when I say CHP you don't recognize it um, but when I say small-scale CHP, it has a different meaning because Capstone manufactures a single-stage jet engine in California. It's an American-made product with 75% U.S. steel. It delivers 70, 80, 90% energy efficiency on one fuel. So we could get plug power out of the wall at 33% electrical efficiency, or we could put it into one of our turbines or another type of CHP technology and get 70 miles, 80 miles, or 90 miles on that same fuel. Um, we, again, go, uh, you know, do it with or without the electric utility grid. We've seen a great deal of, uh, of uh, interest and um, sort of requests for information ever since Sandy rolled through New Jersey and New York. So, um, again, we're placing stationary assets inside the customer's fence, either on the roof, outside the back, unlike the, ge the diesel generator that sits out there and that you hope when you lose the utility power that this unit will kick on, offer a big plume of smoke, and provide power to isolated circuits in the building. Um, unlike that, in a combined heat and power application, we take the fuel and we make base load electricity and base load thermal energy. If the system is designed properly, it could be a dual mode application. Should that anomaly occur on the grid, the unit will issue a, a, a command to the breaker at the utility in service at this corner of the building and say goodbye and it'll continue to operate and go into what we call an island mode. We do that for, we actually do it on, on oil rigs and, uh, and throughout the oil and gas shale industry. Uh, we do it very regularly. So Capstone has 90 distributors worldwide. We make, uh, really make just three jet engines, a 30 kilowatt unit, a 65 kilowatt, and a 200 that we gang together. Folks, we've seen a significant interest in customers wanting their own resiliency. We've seen a significant interest in customers that have older aging infrastructure, such as old boilers that spew significant emissions out the stack, or aging uh, air conditioning or chiller systems that are 20 years old, 30 years old. CHP offers a solution to all of those situations. Quite often somebody will say to me, what is it that you sell? And I say, it's a stationary power product, but maybe more importantly, it's a boiler that makes electricity simultaneously, or it's an air conditioner that makes it uh, 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 electricity simultaneously and by the way it does it with emissions that are ten times cleaner than your car exhaust so through our combustion process we're capable of making this power and reducing the customers carbon footprint I'll give you a real quick example our flagship project in Philadelphia was the Four Seasons Hotel Logan Square um, they were buying hot they were making hot water off the steam loop and um, and uh, we we, you know, it took a while to get the customer educated and convinced, but they bought host properties, Four Seasons Hotel, and in a matter of 120 days, they hit start. We issued the equipment for uh, the equipment order, and uh, the units were delivered to the site. The site was prepped. They picked them up off the ground, put them on the roof. Two weeks later, our team was down there. Everything was hooked up, and we were ready to start them up. 
So we went through our commissioning process and started them up. The day we fired those turbines up, and he started to make 100% of the hot water in the hotel for showers, the pool, the spa, um, he slashed his carbon footprint by 50%, quote, unquote, from Marvin Dixon, the engineer. Um, his energy savings turned out to be $80,000 in, in the first two months and spewed up to a, approximately a three-year uh, return on investment for the client. Um, so there were a lot of key benefits there. Um, the gas utilities were involved to promote efficient, clean, uh, clean technologies. And, uh, and so I, I just ask you to raise your attention to combined heat and power or combined cooling, heating, and power. Again, one fuel in, up to five benefits out. So one of our machines can make hot water, chilled water, electricity, and be there when the grid disappears. We did it through Hurricane Sandy at a number of our sites, and uh, I think you're starting to see through DOE and ICF and EPA folks that combined heat and power really needs a fair shake next to wind and solar. There is no parity on the investment tax credit side. Those other technologies, fuel cell, wind, solar, receive a 30% investment tax credit. 90% of the panels were made overseas. The, the turbines and the, and, the, and the combined heat power market only enjoys a 10% investment tax credit. Our capstone turbines are made domestically in the United States. They deliver 80% efficiency, and they have a shelf li an operating life of 20 to 30 years. So appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, obviously, there's enormous potential for CHP in the country, and of course, there was an executive order issued by the president last August calling for a very, very substantial increase because there is such an enormous potential. And for folks that are interested um, in more information, too, I just wanted to mention that ESI held two forums in May that you um, that the uh, videos and presentations are on our website and basically it it helps provide examples of how CHP and district energy and microgrids how they work together to provide great resilience and and again some terrific examples of systems that stayed up during uh, Hurricane Sandy so that it, there are ways that we can really deal with much greater reliability and resilience as we sort of look at how we move forward to the future. Um, so we're now going to take another turn and, tur and turn to Andy Kunz, who is the President and CEO of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. Andy? Thank you, Carol, and thank you for having us here today. Um, we started the U.S. High Speed Rail Association in 2009 following the President launching the national program. And since then, we've put out a national map with a vision for the country. This is uh, 17,000 miles of all new high speed rail built. Um, and we're, we're actually passing out those brochures now so you can have one of your own. Uh, it also lists the many benefits that High Speed Rail will deliver to America. Number one is um, saving a ton of energy. We, we, if we get a national system built like this map, it's all electrically powered, this could really cut the nation's oil consumption in half or more um, because we use we use 20 million barrels of oil a day in America, and 70% of it's for transportation. So that's really the, the big elephant that we have to tackle. Um, so the, the transportation liquid fuels issue, we're not going to be able to replace oil in those quantities by any number of uh, other fuels. It's just the, the quantities are not going to be able to add up. So what we need to do is move at least a third or half of the trips into trains that are super efficient, and then what's left, we can use uh, electric cars and, and a lot of the other energy sources to power everything. So it's kind of a combination uh, system. And then just inside this brochure, you'll see the energy efficiency of a high-speed train compared to an airplane, for example. Uh, it's about five times more efficient. And I, I think these numbers are actually kind of low. And so the idea is, is that we're, um, the program is moving forward. The government has funded uh, sort of seeding some of the projects. So it, it's really a small start. Well, we've, we've estimated that to build this whole national system is, is probably about $600 billion or more. Um, and so the president has put $10 billion so far. So it's $10 billion more than we've ever spent on high-speed rail, but it's, it's a very small start, and we need to really up those numbers. China is spending something like $500 billion on their high-speed rail system. So that just to give you a, 
a comparison in China, physically their nation, their country is almost the same size as America. The, the width and the height and everything, and their cities are more concentrated over to one side, but they're still covering those long distances. They just opened a new line uh, a few months ago, 1,400 miles long, and they built it all in about four years. So, so what we're trying to do is get this country moving faster, thinking bigger, and, and moving into this more quickly. And to do that, we've been working uh, to bring in private investment as well to, to add to the, the federal investment because we think that in these economic times, it's going to be difficult to ever get the federal government to come up with $600 billion, even if we do it little by little, a little bit each year over the next 20 or 30 years. So what we've been trying to do is get at least half of that from the private sector. And these systems actually around the world make a lot of money. So the investors are very interested. Most of the high-speed operations, say, in France and Japan and these places, they're making billions of dollars of actually net profit at the end of the year. So it, it costs a lot to actually install the systems and get them built, but then once they're operational, private companies take over and actually make a lot of money and, and eventually actually pay down the initial investment. So that's actually a better return on investment than all of our other forms of transportation. So we're here to just basically share information with everybody. We have a booth in the room there. Please come and uh, stop by. We have this map a lot larger. We have videos showing some of the trains that are already in operation around the world. Uh, and you know, join our, join our association if you're a business, mem business uh, person, want to get involved, and we encourage everybody to share the, share the information about High Speed Rail and what it will do for America. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I don't know about everybody else, but I love trains. And the, the situation, I think, is so interesting here in the United States with regard to trains because I don't know about you, but it seems like I keep finding train lovers everywhere. And when you travel in other countries, and whether it's Europe or Asia, the, uh, the amount of trains, the people traveling uh, by trains, the investment that is being made, it should say something to Americans and to our policymakers about the direction that the rest of the world has been going and is going with regard to transportation and what this means to people in every country in terms of getting business done, in terms of the kind of travel that we're doing. So um, I don't know about you, but I hope that we start to look at this much more seriously than what the country has done thus far. So we're now going to turn to David Johnston, who is the CEO and Executive Director of the Exterior Insulation and Finish Systems Members Association. Now that's not the most exciting name for an association, I must say, but I'm, it is also terribly important in terms of thinking about what this really represents with regard to energy efficiency. And I hope one thing that everybody comes away with is how complementary all of these different pieces that we've been hearing about really are and that they each play a very, very important role in terms of developing a sustainable, clean energy economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. I, I would have to agree with you that it's not the most exciting name going. I did not name it. I want you to know that. And I, and I didn't name the, uh, the system that I'm about to talk about, Exterior Insulation and Finish Systems, EFS, uh, that I would much prefer a much more simpler name like uh, the Clark Bar or Mars Candy Bar or something like that. Uh, before I uh, begin, I'd like to in, um, recognize my colleague, Scott Robinson. Scott, would you raise your hand in b b back in the room there? He's t uh, tweeting away, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Exterior Insulation and uh, Finished Systems uh, uh, Industry Members Association, we're a small group. We, uh, uh, the industry is about $2 billion annually, and that includes the designers, it includes the suppliers, the manufacturers, and uh, the um, applicators and the distributors of, of the system. Uh, what uh, exterior insulation and finish systems are, and they're otherwise known as EFs in the industry. EFs are uh, basically a system uh, comprised of, uh, uh, you, you have the exterior wall which is called the substrate. That's not part of the uh, EIFS, um, but um, you would have the uh, substrate and the EFs attached to the substrate. So 
on the uh, exterior wall of the uh, Cannon uh, House office building, you would put on, first of all, a water-resistive barrier, then uh, followed by the adhesive. Then you would have a, a rigid foam insulation board attached to that. A base coat to provide strength, and in that base coat you have a reinforcing mesh that's made out of fiberglass. Then you have a decorative uh, finish applied to it, and the most simple system makes it look like stucco, but uh, the, the um, finish can really look like brick, polished metal, limestone, marble, you name it. it uh, because it uh, is mixed and put into uh, a five-gallon bucket, I'm speaking of the finish system now, you can basically get any color of the rainbow. Uh, the, the real star of the show uh, for uh, our industry is the, the quality of it, the attribute, is the energy efficiency of uh, EIFS. It in, it, it, because it falls in the category of uh, continuous insulation, um, it, it uh, provides uh, a thermal blanket on the exterior of the house. So rather than insulation being in the stud wall cavities, it goes on the outside of the house and is covered by your uh, decorative finish. So it really does uh, enhance uh, thermal efficiency and uh, in some cases anywhere from uh, 20 um, to 25 percent beyond uh, uh, traditional wall claddings with in-cavity uh, wall um, insulation or in-cavity insulation. Uh, we've had a study done by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and it shows that uh, EIFS is uh, far superior to competing wall um, uh, uh, claddings and uh, in both uh, thermal efficiency as well as moisture control. Uh, one of our speakers here talked about uh, uh, leaks, all buildings leak, and, um, uh, but um, EFS is able to uh, control that leakage better than other uh, wall claddings. Uh, I would like to uh, point out that uh, in uh, 2013 uh, the Department of Energy is going to require that uh, um, all states adopt at what's known as ASHRAE 90.1, uh, the 2010 edition of this uh, energy efficiency standard. And uh, this uh, ASHRAE 90.1 is going to require some elements of continuous insulation, and uh, EIFS can meet that. I'd like to read here what, uh, um, uh, what continuous insulation is. Continuous insulation is that insulation that's continuous across all structural member members without thermal bridges other than fasteners and service openings. It installed on the interior or exterior or is integral to any opaque surface of the building envelope. And with that, that um, EIFS is probably the, the purest form of continuous insulation because it can be attached um, adhesively. There's been some questions about the appearance. I've answered that. There's been some questions about the durability of EIFS. EIFS can uh, meet the uh, hurricane requirements established by the uh, Miami-Dade uh, County uh, area. So um, EIFS is also in the uh, 2009 International Building Code and International Residential Code, and um, it, it's a great way to save some of that 40 percent of the uh, uh, energy that's used in the United States within buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it's always so interesting to learn about how different technologies have evolved, how they're being applied and, and being utilized, and also to understand that codes continue to strengthen and need to. And, and the thing is there are a lot of different ways to go ahead and to meet those so that um, it, it's really important to encourage codes to continually be strengthened across the country. Um, and I think uh, a major issue is trying to encourage that to overcome opposition to new codes because it just improves everybody's building structures by, um, uh, by allowing us to always incorporate improved technology. We have a few minutes left, so if you've got any questions, now is the time that we can take about five minutes for questions. You've got a lot of expertise here. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll go over here. Hi, uh, Juliana, I'm right for uh, e &E. uh, This is uh, for Jennifer on the ESPC issue. I was wondering if you could just sort of weigh in on some of the difficulty that uh, champions in Congress have had getting CDO to score these things with how to price tag and, you know, if there's any 
way through that in a way that the you know industry could structure these things better or you know um, get over that hurdle? We ran into this story issue um, in 2002 when we first started to re, uh, need to reauthorize um, ESPCs. They're now permanently reauthorized, but we swallowed a very large score in the offing. The the problem is simply that. Um, CBO looks at ESPCs and the fact that you've entered, the federal government enters into a long-term contract with the energy service company to pay them back. That is now a mandatory expenditure. Meanwhile, you're getting paid back out of appropriated dollars that are appropriated for energy bills. Those are discretionary. You wouldn't know it when the Navy had to appropriate an extra billion dollars during the energy crisis in the early 2000s because we really do pay our energy bills in the government, but it is discretionary money because it's annual appropriations. As for solution, we have looked and looked and looked for a way to restructure contracts that would make it work better. It's not an option. I will tell you that the Office of Management and Budget does not score ESPCs. That is very different from almost every other thing that CBO scores. CBO will admit that it's a different cat, ESPCs. It has a guarantee. That's unusual. It is the nature of the guarantee that led OMB not to score it. Um, so I don't know if there's a solution here, but the scorekeepers are the budget committee, CBO, and OMB. And we have OMB not scoring, and currently CBO and the budget committees that do. So <laughs> we continue to work on it ever so slowly. So questions need to continually be asked of those bodies. Okay, other questions or comments? All right, then I want to thank our panel very, very much. And please make sure that you um, check out their exhibits and ask lots of questions. This is a great opportunity to take advantage of having all these folks here. Thank you very much.